the Fly, Fly Physics Systems has been working on this new optically pumped magnetometer. And so I'm very pleased that Dave Schuler from Applied Physics Systems has been able to join us and he's going to share with us where they're at in the development process. So I'll hand it over to you, Dave. Oh, great, thanks uh, Thanks for having me today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm David Schuler, and I've been with 2G Enterprises for 25 years now. And I'm currently working at the applied physics side of 2G Enterprises. And uh, we've been working with these new optically pumped magnetometer sensors to try and develop some, some more cost-effective uh, ways to measure rocks. Uh, for those of you excuse me, that have that missed our, our webinar in early March. There's a link here, It's there's still a recording of it up on the internet. I would encourage you to go view that. Um, I didn't wanna repeat a, too much of the information from that webinar, it's still available for you to go see it if you missed it. This is the new instrument that we currently have on the market. We're calling it the Model 110 OPRM for optically pumped rock magnetometer. Um, it consists of the automatic sample handler, magnetic shielding, the magnetometer sensor, as well as operating electronics and computer and software controls. So first a little bit about the, the OPM sensor that we're using. It's made by a company called QSpin in Colorado. Um, it's a very small room temperature sensor. You can see by the schematic, it's only about an inch by three quarters of an inch by a half inch thick. And they have two measurement axes, um, a, a direction that they call Y, which we were actually measuring the axial component, the Z component for the SRM users of the rock, and an orthogonal uh, Y axis as well. Um, they're very sensitive at less than 15 femtotesla per root hertz. So these zero field optically pumped magnetometers have extreme sensitivity when the, the magnetic background is very small. The atoms in the vapor cell, the sensing cell, which are made of rubidium, are heated to gaseous state. And when the field is nearly zero, they are mostly transparent and allow maximum light into the photo detector. But as the magnetic field increases, the, the uh, atoms absorb more light and that changes the current going into the photo sensor. So to summarize, you know, light from a laser is contained in the sensor all, and it's passed through the vapor cell and collected by the photodiode on the other side, converting it to an ele electrical current and this forms the optically pumped magnetometer. These sensors need a very low field environment to work. Uh, the sensors themselves are equipped with nulling coils that can null a field of about 50 nanotesla. But because of the extreme sensitivity of these sensors, it's optimal to create a very low field environment that is as stable as possible to avoid measuring noise. Um, 15 femtotesla sensitivity in a 50 nanotesla field would produce you know, quite a big signal. So to do this, we've made a five layer shield. The outer four layers are bu metal, and the innermost is made of ferrite. And these ferrite materials provide good magnetic shielding, pretty similar to the uh, high permeability metals, but they have lower intrinsic magnetic noise generated by the thermal Johnson currents due to their high electrical resistivity. So is, as I said, this is the current version that we have in production. Um, it's a single sensor magnetometer with two measurement axes with an automatic sample handler for translation and rotation. Um, so the, the two me measurement axes are, like I said, along the Z axis of the rock um, for, for the SRM users, that would be the Z axis. And the other axis is along the vertical axis, what you would call the X axis. So this does make rotation necessary to measure the vector components of all three axes. Uh, if you'd like to see a video of a, of a single measurement, you can use this link as well. I didn't have a chance to embed it here today, but again, that is on the, um, the webinar, if you'd like to view that as well. 
it shows that it only takes about a minute to measure a sample, depending on which routine that you choose. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The performance we're currently getting out of the magnetometer, it's the short-term background noise um, of our feedback measurement system is in the 10 to the minus eight EMU range, sort of mid range. But because of the one over F noise, sort of the, the drift of the magnetometer, the practical noise level for measurements right now is about five times 10 to the minus seven EMU for both axes. So be, because of, this is a different kind of measurement, it does come with some challenge for the, the rock magnetism customers. And we're measuring flux density rather than magnetic moment. So that challenged us to convert the data to EMU. And we've done this by creating a series of uniformly magnetized samples that we are measuring in the superconducting rock magnetometer and this magnetometer and coming up with a calibration constant to compare the data. Um, another point of the, of uh, another challenge is that it's got a very small dynamic range of only plus or minus five nanotesla. So to overcome this, we've created a feedback coil system where we keep the sensor at low fields and measure the feedback current to get our magnetic measurements. And then because the field falls away by one over R cubed, the position of the sample to the sensor is very critical. The sample handler right now is programmed to bring the sample to one millimeter from the sensor. So a sample positioning error of another millimeter can lead to pretty big error. So that is something we have to be very careful about. Um, in addition, irregular sized samples um, also pose a, pose a bit of a challenge. Um, excuse me. Um, so there's some measurement techniques that we developed and this is something that we're gonna be looking for our users to help us out with. Um, we want to know what sort of the best measurement routine is going to be for the users, depending on the rock. We have routines where it will ask you to put the rock in in the plus Z direction and it will rotate each 90 degrees and take a measurement. Um, we've also programmed it where you can um, put it in the plus and minus Z directions. You can have it take a zero in between each measurement to reduce the one over F noise. And there's a routine where you can put all six sort of faces of the rock up against the sensor and measure that um, in many different directions. And depending on um, the sensitivity, the strength of the sample and how much time that you wanna spend measuring, we can use all of these routines. Um, We'd also you know, like some feedback from customers if, if they think spinning is the best way to go. We can make this a, a spinner magnetometer type as well. And perhaps um, the addition of more sensors would be useful. So we're sort of at the point in this instrument right now where we'd like to get it you know, into the hands of more users that we can. Um, of course, anybody is welcome to come to Applied Physics and use this instrument anytime they would like. And we're trying to think of ways to get it out into people's hands more often. Um, you know, we definitely would consider renting this instrument um, as even sort of an investigative period if anybody's interested in buying one. So if anyone's interested, please contact me and, and let me know. Um, fortunately for us, we were finally able to get our magnetometer up to Nick's lab in Berkeley just this week. And he generously allowed us some space to set up and Yiming Zhang measured some samples for us on the OPRM and the SRM, and he, he provided us this data. Oops. He measured 
measured our uni uniformly magnetized calibration sample, and he measured a basalt, a sandstone, and a carbonite sample several times on each instrument. Um, our standard sample there is in yellow with the optically pump magnetometer readings as shown as circles and the SRM readings as squares. The uh, green marks are the basalt, the red is the sandstone, and the purple is the carbonite. And you can see right there how the uh, measurements that Yiming took compared. Um, this is great. This is the first time we've been able to have, you know, potential customer use this and give us some feedback. So this is very useful for us. There's the same data on a logarithmic scale. And now we have some data for the angular variation. This is the basalt sample, as you can see. The sandstone. Carbonate. And this is our sample that was uh, manufactured and magnetized in the Z direction. I'd like to thank Nick and Yiming very much for this data. Um, they're gonna be keeping the instrument uh, for a few weeks at least and doing some more measurements for us and we'll make that data available as soon as we can. I'm really looking forward to that. So the next version that we're going to be building is, is a version to use with the RAPID system. It'd be the same RAPID sample handler with degauss and uh, ARM capabilities, just fitted for the optically pump magnetometer. And one very nice thing about that is it should only be about six and a half feet tall and fit into a standard room. And considering the price and about $300,000 cheaper than the superconducting version. We're also building a U-channel version of this, which will look nearly identical to the current versions, only with a smaller magnetometer. Um, the, what we have envisioned for the U-channel magnetometer is an array of four sensors at 90 degrees positioned as close as we possibly can to the sample. Um, you know, with the sensor, the sensor has a resolution itself of five millimeters. The sensing cell of rubidium is actually five millimeters cube. So depending on how close we can get these sensors to the sample, we should be getting, we should be getting resolution in order of magnitude at least above the SRM, which I think could be very useful. Um, I, I know some, some of the core repositories would just like to measure measure lengths, kilometers worth of cores for reversals. And we think this could do this very quickly. We're also experimenting with these optically pumped sensors in the superconducting shield. Um, since the shielding is so critical to the performance of these and, and we know how to build superconducting shields, we wanna see what the optimum performance will be in a trapped low stable field. Um, so the, you know, this is a, so I have such a brief presentation today, but I just wanted to bring you up to date on what the new things we've been doing. If you want more information on the magnetometer, please look again at the, uh, the webinar and contact me if you, uh, if you have any questions. Well, great. Thank you very much, David. Do we have questions in the audience? I'm scanning. Um, let's see. Any hands up? Um, I guess while we're waiting for that, I had a question. I, oh, Phil. Oh, go it? ahead. If you have one, go ahead. I was just going to ask about if I understand correctly from what you said, the the sensor is placed very close to the to the specimen, so just a couple yes. millimeters. So does yes, that mean you're you're really restricted to a very specific sample size and shape? 
So you can't kind of have an irregularly shaped sample. If if you have um, many different shapes and sizes, that would be somewhat of a challenge. We can make different shape sample holders to fit. We are currently 3D printing our sample holders. So you can make sample holders to match your sample to bring it very close to the sensor. I mean, if you have a lot of different unusual things, of course, that's gonna be a challenge. Right. Um, but would the, so you could you could fit it into a regular regularly shaped sample holder, but then maybe the distribution of the moment would be more heterogeneous, um, which might be more of a problem the closer you are, the closer the sensors are to the sample as opposed to being a little bit farther away. Yes. Yeah, my question was basically along the same lines as a standard kind of paleomagnetic sample has a volume of like 10 to 12 cubic centimeters, right? And so right. this implies that what we're measuring um, and the sensitivity of what we're measuring will vary even within the volume of the sample. Um, so I was wondering when you're doing a test at Nick's lab, I see Nick's here, um, uh, how does that play into what is getting measured? And, and of course, sample heterogeneity within the sample then would matter too. But even just assuming a homogeneous sample, uh, what is actually being detected then? Um, yes, it's uh, it's true that if you, if you don't have a heterogeneous sample, it will or or a standard size, it will affect measurement. Um, you know, the, the ways we're overcoming right this right now is measuring it in many different orientations. Um, you know, of course, some of Nick's samples were only about uh, half an inch, say, and when you when you put the face of the rock right up next to the sensor, it's not going to be so much bothered that the, the back half of the sample isn't there. But when you measure it in the superconducting magnetometer, since it has a pickup coil, you're measuring the true moment. Um, so, you know, we're, we're thinking of the best ways to overcome these problems. Um, I think that multiple sensors and multiple orientations of measurements are going to help quite a bit with this. Um, yeah, but, but of, oh, go on, Dave. No, no, you go ahead, Nick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think in terms of, I mean, I, what, what you're both saying is, you know, basically, right, you can think of the sensor, right, you were measuring the sort of flux that's coming up and sort of going through the sensor on the, on the, on the z-axis there, right, um, and so you are, yeah, you are sensitive to what's, what's closer, closer to it. I think one of the things we're going to do next is a, uh, we just have a thermal demagnetization sequence on some dye based cells going through in the, in the lab, um, and we're just, we'll measure samples from a, from a few sites on the OPRM in addition to the SRM as we progressively um, demag for a comparison point there. Um, I think one of the challenges, which is a little bit of a sort of engineering one, as sort of Dave, Dave said, is needing that reproducibility of that distance, right? You know, we're particularly interested in the relative uh, change, right, as we're doing that thermal demag sequence, right? And so I think some of the variability that we're seeing in the comparison of the SRM and OP, OPRM data um, and the intensity that Dave showed is probably due to those sort of slight variations in in, in distance. So, will will you mean you, I uh, good, big kudos go to you Ming for this you know this instrument uh, arrived in the lab on Tuesday and you Ming made these measurements and uh, got the plots together uh, uh, yes yes yesterday. So um, so anyway we have we have a limited experience now, but I think it will be important for us to try to. Um, and you know whether sort of improvements in the holders can help help with this too, right? In terms of making sure that standoff distance is like very reproducible um, between each step, you know, as we're doing the thermal demag sequence, for example. This might be more complicated in one sense, but would it be useful to measure do double measurements, one at one distance and one at a slightly different distance? Um, that would be certainly be something easy for us to program in. These are exactly the kinds of things that we are looking for feedback on. We don't measure a lot of rocks ourselves at applied physics. We, we haven't. So these practical everyday um, issues that are going to come up is exactly why we want to get more people to use this if we can get the opportunity and get this feedback.
So I noticed in the, the comparison measurements there, it looked like the, the optical magnetometer was measuring consistently higher moments. Is that is that true? So that's likely a sample shape issue. I don't want to okay. Dave, Dave go on it, but and so that's one thing, just because we were moving quickly with the things we had it at hand. So we were measuring a number of of one one centimeter. Uh, long, long spe specimens, whereas okay. the calibration sample is the sort of standard inch. Uh, to, yeah. To, to yeah, I was wondering if you had a, had a handle on what that discrepancy was related to. So. Yeah, so that's the, the to, so to get that true uh, sort of moment, moment calibration, uh, at least the way that um, Bill's, Bill's dis discussed it with us is that you need, you want to have a sort of calibration sample that's a similar geometry to what you're right. doing. So I don't think that's going to, for the relative intensity, say during a demagnetization sequence, right. that's, that's not going to matter. And so actually for most types of experiments, even, you know, yeah. paleo intensity ones, right? It's, uh, <laughs> we're, it's very much the relative change we, we care about, but, um, but yeah, so I think that's why you know we you see we reproduce for their calibration one the same the same value, but then for the ones that are these shorter shorter cores, it's, it's yeah, and systematically as you saw. Do we have other questions for David? Yeah, we have one in the chat there, Julie. Oh, I didn't see it. It's hiding. Uh, oh, from from Matt Hamilton. Matt, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it? Um, okay, I see what, what would be the advantage over a standard spinner magnetometer. Um, some, the JR6 are advertising sensitivity of 10 to minus six, where you said that the OPRM has a noise level about half of that. That is correct. Um, and we think right now some of that noise is due to our feedback system. We think that in the long run, we're going to get even lower background noise like than that. Um, the advantages, another advantage should be faster measurement time. You should be able to measure sample. And I should ask Yi Ming about this right now, how long it was taking him to measure each sample, but you know, a, a minute or so, depending on which routine you select. I mean, we think it's, you know, it's, it's gonna be quite competitive in price to the JR6 as well. Uh, yeah, from, from my experience, uh... Uh, experience measuring takes um, quite short time, a minute, to flip the sample or manually flip along the axis of the rock specimen. Uh, it's um, giving me a feeling it's similar to um, like the SRM with rapid system, uh, but in terms of sample, sample handling. But indeed, I realized the uh, sample moment is um, how accurate that will be is very much dependent on what sample you use to calibrate the OPRM with. Um, so, but reproducibility is, is also um, pretty, pretty good um, from the limited sample that I've tried. Yeah, we feel good. Yeah, we did just get the magnetometer up there this week, so they haven't had very much time to use it, but uh, hopefully we'll be getting a lot more data. Yeah, yeah, and there was the, the sort of directional uh, similarity was a lot tighter than in the uh, when it, and then in the in the webinar, which I think is probably uh, some of those who are in the webinar are probably uh, pleased 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 to to see that actually. Yes, and, and I think that was largely your more careful measurement techniques. We're, we're not very experienced with that. Thanks, thanks for the vote of confidence. <laughs> we have another question in the chat from Robert uh, Schulger. Is, he says, is this measurement of a vector component or a scalar intensity in the vicinity of the sample? A scalar intensity in the vicinity of the sample. Okay. Do you have any follow up to that, Robert? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I was wondering, because I'm also working in exploration geophysics, and uh, therefore we have often basalts and uh, metal samples where we need to use a similar technique with flux gate uh, magnetometers. And Naya, it's, uh, you have to say, a 
the, the scalar intensity in the vicinity of the sample does not always immediately reflect the remnants of the sample. There's, it's a little bit more difficult, but uh, for strong samples, you know, we use it. Yeah. Yeah. Any last questions before we move on? All right, I guess we're now a little ahead of time. Oh, uh, but thank 